If Wilfred Owen's sonnet, Dulce et Decorum Est, is a double backflip, then uh, R.S. Gwynn's Body Bags is a triple backflip. It's three sonnets chained together, um, and it's one of my favorite poems in my top 20 list, um, because each sonnet is amazing, and then all three sonnets sort of work together to create another amazing work of art. Um, the conceit of the whole poem is body bags. Body bags are associated with murder. In this case, they're going to be associated with war, you know, with uh, bodies of soldiers coming back in body bags. I often think of a morgue in which there are body bags and there's toe tags where each corpse has a, a little tag on it that tells you the person's name. Uh, the conceit of the poem is that we have three dead men. We have three sonnets, and each sonnet is their body bag in some ways, um, with some exceptions on the last sonnet where there is, if you will, not just a volta, but a mega volta that turns the whole poem around. The poem is mostly constructed in a Petrarchan way. We can see that there's eight lines that describe the life of a man, and then the six lines describe his death. So they're kind of mini biographies. Um, and like a lot of sonnets, it moves, um, a lot of modern sonnets, it moves from the objective to the personal. We don't know right away that there's a fourth person sort of haunting this poem. It is the speaker of the poem. He has a way of connecting all three of these dead men. And the poem is a little bit like a mystery um, because you're trying to figure out what is the connection between the speaker and these three men and what is the connection between these three men and, and why are they all dead? What happened there? Um, the poem is also fantastic because it moves through a variety of tones. Um, one word I often use to describe this poem is sardonic and sometimes wry. Um, and, and what I mean by that is it has a sort of funny sense of humor. Um, it's not above a joke. Um, although the jokes are sort of what we sometimes call gallows humor. They're sort of dark jokes. Um, and there's sort of a darkness to the poem since it is about body bags and death um, that sort of make it have a sort of grim sense of humor, I suppose. But we're going to meet three guys. Um, so let's go through the three guys that we're going to meet. The first one we're going to meet is Dwayne Coburn, who's a baseball player with a bit of a kleptomania problem. He likes to steal. Um, and so the poem opens, um, and this is a great opening for a poem, with invitation. It's almost like we're at a pep rally, and we're supposed to do three cheers for Dwayne Coburn. This poem is uh, kind of in praise of. You know, it's kind of an ode to these three men, although the more we read about these men, the more unremarkable and sometimes unadmirable they are. The third guy is pretty much the most genuine of the three, but they all have, like, they're humans. They're both good and bad. So let's read the, the octave. Notice that it is mostly a Petrarchan in rhyme scheme, although it deviates a little bit. It's ABBA, but then it goes to CDDC, and then... It's supposed to, you know, sort of do a triplet, EFG, EFG, but instead it goes EFG, FEG. And he sort of variates on that and changes it according to his needs, according to each sonnet. So let's read the octave. Let's hear it for Dwayne Coburn, who was small and mean without a single saving grace, except for stealing, home from second base or out of his teammates' lockers. It was all the same to Dwayne. The Pep Club candy sale, however, proved his downfall. He was held briefly on various charges, then expelled or given a choice, enlist or go to jail. So, kind of a, the sad life of Dwayne Coburn. He's small and mean and doesn't really have any good qualities, but he's good at stealing. Um, we have this little dash here that's part of the sardonic humor. He can steal home from second base, which is a pretty far steal if you think about it. Home from second base or out of his teammates' lockers. It was all the same to Dwayne. But he stole from, uh, well, he stole from his teammates, he stole home from second base, and then we learned that he stole from the Pep Club candy sale. Um, that proved his downfall. Notice that we have a lot of sentences ending in the middle. We have in jammed lines that sort of make the poem move very smoothly. But every once in a while, we do have um, a, a sort of end stop line to sort of create a little bit of humor with the, the rhyming sound, because rhymes are usually associated with humor. But he got caught at the Pep Club candy sale, and he was given a choice. Um, ex he was expelled from school, and then he was given a choice, enlist or go to jail. Enlist is the first time in the poem that we start, uh, we start seeing something related to the military and to the army. And we're going to see that this military imagery and army lingo shows up more and more as the poem goes on. It gives us a clue toward the fate of these men. <coughs> and we have to know a little bit of military lingo just to even follow the poem. 
Well, he decides not to go to jail. He enlists. We know this because of how his fate works out in the Sestep. He finished basic training. He finished basic training and came home from Bragg. That's Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He finished basic and came home from Bragg for Christmas on his reassignment leave with one prize in his pack he thought unique, which went off prematurely New Year's Eve. The student body got the folded flag and flew it in his memory for a week. Now, we, we see that the, the poem is not above a little bit of alliteration, you know, sort of lovely ways of making the poem seem decorative like typical sonnets are, but we get a kind of dismal story. He came home from Christmas with a prize in his pack he thought unique. Um, uh, students usually tell me that it's a grenade or a mortar round or something explosive, and he was going to maybe set it off on New Year's Eve and impress everybody, like, oh, you think that bottle rocket's impressive? Look what I got. I have a military-grade explosion that I, of course, stole, since that's his character trait, stole illegally from the base. But he stole it and it went off prematurely, like it blew up in his backpack. Um, the student body got his folded flag and flew it in his memory for a week. So it's not a wartime death. It's sort of a, the dismal death of a thief who kind of blew himself up. Um, the student body and the let's hear it indicates there's something about this poem that is very high school, right? The high school got his flag, and even though he was expelled from school and was a thief, they flied in his memory for a week. So that's one death down, the baseball player and thief, Dwayne Coburn. But our speaker has not shown up in the poem yet. He shows up in the middle of the poem um, when we learn about Dennis Wampus Peterson, who's a football player. Again, we have the same pattern, right? Um, art is all about patterns. We have the life of uh, Dennis Wampus Peterson. He has a nickname. And then we have the death. And our speaker is going to show up in the poem. And we're going to get more clues about when this poem is said and what the poem's really up to. It opens with, you know, just acknowledging a fact about football, that good pull pulling guards were scarce in high school ball. The ones who had the weight were usually slow as lumber trucks. A scaled-down wild man, though, like Dennis Wampus Peterson, could haul his ass around right in for me to slip behind his blocks. Played college ball a year. Redshirted when they yanked his scholarship because he majored, so he claimed, in beer. It's a good little sense of humor there, but we have Dennis Wampus Peterson. He is not really that big a guy. He's scaled down, and that's important because he's going to put on weight at the, um, at the second part of the poem. But he's uh, a guy who does a good job as a pulling guard. And he is able, notice our speaker shows up, he played football with Dennis Wampus Peterson. He would, um, he would help him get uh, around the blocks, right, to slip behind his blocks. And he was such a good football player that he ended up going to college. He played college ball a year. And then he got redshirted when they yanked his scholarship because he majored, so he claimed, in beer. So we see that he has a little bit of an alcohol problem. It cost him his college scholarship. And just to reveal some secrets of the poem, you know, um, this is a 1960s poem. We see this right here in 1969. So we're in a Vietnam uh, War era type of poem. If you were in college, you were exempt from the draft. He was kicked out of college, so just like uh, Dwayne Coburn in stanza, uh, sonnet number one, Dennis Wampus Peterson has to go off to war. You know, sort of against his will. He's drafted. Um, it's not said, but we understand that by the leap here. Our narrator shows up very strongly with the eye. I saw him one last time. He'd added weight around the neck, used words like grunt and slope, and said he'd swap his Harley and his dope in both balls for a 4F knee like mine. This happened in the spring of 68. He hanged himself in 1969. You know we're in the presence of an amazing poet when he can just slip the date, 1969, the numbers, into the rhyme scheme and the meter of his poem, almost flawlessly. But it's sad, right? Um, when our narrator sees him, he's clearly in a bar, and the guy has put on weight, whereas he used to be scaled down, and he's using what I would call rough infantry lingo. He's using words like grunt, which would be, you know, the lowest soldier in the chain, the, um, the, the infantry soldier, and he's using racist terms like slope, which was Similar to like Charlie or Gook, it was sort of a racial slur that was used to describe the Viet Cong. Um, and when he meets, when our football player meets our narrator, he says, he obviously is jealous of our narrator in some ways. Our narrator has a 4F knee. 
And Dennis Swampus Peterson said he'd swap his Harley and his dope and both balls, his motorcycle, his marijuana, you know, we've moved from alcohol to um, another drug, and both of his balls for a 4F knee like mine. He uses sort of rough masculine language. Um, what is a 4F knee? A 4F knee is a classification that gets you out of the draft. So our narrator has been, been given an exemption from the draft of the Vietnam War, and whatever um, Dennis Wampus Peterson experienced or saw there, he's not doing well. He would have given anything not to have been drafted, to have an exempt from it. And if nothing else, we know this because our narrator talked to him in the spring of 68 and he hanged himself in 1969. So we have a baseball player thief who blew himself up and we have an alcoholic, drug addicted um, football player who hangs himself. Um, so we've got to meet our third guy and see what is pulling all this poem together. Our third guy is not so bad, and I will say that this stanza is different from the rest because it has what I call the mega volta of the poem, where the whole poem shifts. What we have in the third stanza is basically just a flirt. He's a ladies' man. Um, to really understand this poem, you have to know who Roy Orbison is. He sings, pretty woman walking down the street, and he wears dark sunglasses. You know, he's a very tall, high-tenored guitar player, um, sings beautiful music from the 60s. Um, he's famous for Pretty Woman and Only the Lonely and for a song called It's Over. And in this particular scene, they're at Linrock Park and Jay Sweeney is lip syncing to it, imitating um, Roy Orbison. Um, the life and death of Jay Sweeney is in the, in the entire octave here because the whole poem is going to turn at the bottom. Jay Sweeney did a great Roy Orbison impersonation once at Linrock Park lip syncing to its over in his dark glasses beside the jukebox. He was one who'd want no better for an epitaph than he was good with girls and charmed them by opening his billfold to a photograph. Big Brother, the Marine, who didn't die. Right, by just saying who didn't die, we get the idea that Jay Sweeney was also like the previous two guys drafted, and he's probably the only one who actually died um, in the war. We see that he was good with girls. Sometimes students are puzzled that he would open his wallet and he would show girls, you know, a, a conversation piece, something to talk about, pictures of his big brother, the Marine, and he's really proud of him and he's fighting in the war. Um, but our narrator, just in three words, in a, in a fragmented sentence, shows us that this guy doesn't make it. He also becomes a body bag. Um, and the only one who sort of dies in, a, in the legitimate battle of um, the Vietnam War. So, our whole poem shifts now. After we've been through these three guys, our narrator says that Jay Sweeney comes to mind years from that summer night, the summer night that he heard Jay Sweeney, you know, lip syncing. Years from that summer night in class, for no good reason while I talk about Thoreau's remark that one injustice makes prisoners of us all. So we learn things about our narrator. We learn that he's a teacher or a professor. And he's probably a teacher of literature or maybe philosophy. He's teaching Thoreau. And he's written on the board, or he's, uh, he's going to write on the board, one injustice makes prisoners of us all. And as he's writing that phrase on the board, he thinks of Jay Sweeney and that night at Linrock Park. He says he comes into his mind for no good reason, but maybe it's just buried and repressed in our narrator why he thinks about Jay Sweeney in relation to this. Um, the narrator finishes the poem with sort of like a cinematic fade to black. The piece of chalk with which he's writing splinters and flakes and fragments as I write to settle in the tray where all the dust is. It's an image of falling and decay and degradation and death, you know, the idea of dust which our bodies turn into. And there's something very sad about that. Um, the thing that always makes me most love this poem is the rhyme of injustice with dust is. Maybe not the greatest rhyme of the poem, but I, I mean, in the world, but for some reason it just makes my jaw drop because I never could have come up with that. Now, what does it mean that one injustice makes prisoners of us all? Our narrator is imprisoned. He had a 4F knee. He was exempted from the draft of the Vietnam War. He escaped, and these three guys did not. And it sometimes seems chancy, right? We sometimes call this survivor's guilt. Why did I live and they didn't get to live? That's not just. It's not fair. Why was I born with this 4F knee? Why did um, this guy have to, why did Dennis Wampus Peterson have to hang himself from what he experienced there? The injustice here could be uh, this wonderful thing, a good example of how poetry can be suggestive without being definitive. It can be the injustice of death and how random it can be. 
the injustice of the draft and how random that can be, the injustice of the Vietnam War. It can be sort of an anti-Vietnam War poem, um, all built around three body bags and a twist at the end of the poem where our narrator is the one who connects them all together. It's a triple backflip of a poem and one of my favorites for sure.